negative parental reactions are. They're pretty awful when they occur, but even the kind of neutral parental reactions are not good. And the problem is knowledge, because most of the time the parents don't know uh, is the issue, let alone have any chance to react. And, and then the emotional qualities in the relationship, which of course is important. But this is the problem here, that, that youth are very reluctant to tell their parents as if they're some kind of criminal. Now the attitude, attitudes driving homophobia in students who victimize are also very important. The bullies, the, the homophobic bullies, their parental attitudes are incredibly important. Most of them come from families in which homosexuality is denigrated and talked about in negative terms. And this one is very important. It comes across through all the research. There's enormous pressure on young boys to prove their heterosexuality and to avoid being misclassified. The best way to avoid being misclassified is to make sure you bully the ones that you think might be gay or lesbian, most of whom are not. Most of homophobic bullying in schools is kids that are just a bit gender discordant for some reason. They're not good at sport or whatever that is considered masculine in that school. Now, what have been the direct attempts then to change this, apart from all the political ones and the medical ones I was talking about before? Well, there have been a number of studies, and this has been updated, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute, but a lot of these studies, they're, they're conducted in students in American colleges, very few in this country. They mostly focus on giving a bit of information, talking about attitudes, and then they have this contact theory. So they, they bring in a panel, it's pretty awful sometimes, a panel of gay people to sit in the front and tell all the students about how nice they are and how they needn't be worried by them. I'm caricaturizing it, but it does feel a bit strange when you read what some of these things have been. Some of them are more imaginative, which I'll show you in a minute. But they, they're not particularly strong, the interventions. It, it looks like you know, people have to have prolonged exposure to these issues to really change in their attitudes. So, not that impressive. Sebastian Bartels at Surrey University has just updated this review. He was in touch with me and um, finding pretty much the same thing. And many of the studies go unpublished for some unknown reason. They're found in PhD theses and all sorts of things. Um, what about the UK? Well, what's particularly interesting in the UK is schools. The one area that seems to be where these interventions should be aimed is not college students, it's primary schools. And even Stonewall gets nervous about primary school interventions. But there's been a really classic one in, well, let me tell you first about this YouGov poll, because it's showing that teachers are always reporting that homophobic bullying is very common. This is not just coming from the kids. And that it's about second to weight. I didn't realize bullying about weight actually trumped bullying about uh, homosexuality, but apparently it does, according to the teachers. There's a pretty nasty lot of kids out there. <laughs> First it's the weight, and then it's your sexuality, so if you're fat and homosexual, you have it. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is, uh, and uh, teachers say it goes unreported, but even worse, that they, um, you know, they've heard homophobic language, and in one particular school I'll show you, they didn't think it was homophobic to say, oh, he's so gay. That's okay for quite a lot of teachers, apparently. So there's quite a lot of work to be done here. But of the teachers who have tried to do anything, a lot of them would do it again. So it seems to be quite a rewarding thing to do. Teachers were completely ham hampered by Margaret Thatcher's Clause 28. They were frightened to do this sort of thing at that point. Um, now, the, the really good example, and some of you may know about this, started in a, in, a, in a school in Southwark, and they, based on the fact that in 2009 they found this terrible situation, just like the YouGov thing, they also found this, as what I was saying before, that the word gay wasn't particularly homophobic, if used in a pejorative sense wasn't homophobic. And none of them had any training. This is a primary school, and I think that's really the key word here. And they, they brought in a really involved program of training for all staff, including the caretaker, the secretaries, not just the teachers, they involved the governors, and they didn't involve the pupils. And that's what's really interesting, then it was cascaded out, so the change in teachers' attitudes was really important. And this has won awards, it's, over the last two or three years it's been enormously successful. And what's, what I think is really interesting is the outcomes, because you can always prove change in attitudes, but what they measured were objective measures of attendance at the schools and attainment went up in the schools. So when you stop that, that homophobic bullying climate, all the rest of the people seem to do quite well. It seems to bring in a different 
atmosphere. And this has now been extended to schools and universities and community groups. So it looks like, I know um, here it's at the universities, but I still think in the primary schools might be the best place. We know that when children have gay or lesbian <coughs> parents, that the best time to really be sharing that with the kids is early on, or if they've got a gay or lesbian brother. Pre-pubertal kids seem to be the best time to tell them about it before they get hardened attitudes. Just um, very quickly, because this is quite bizarre, I think, but anyway, just to show you, um, there are interventions um, that are imaginative. One of them in America, in America had the experiencing alienation. This was a way of reducing homophobia. I think it's slightly mad, some of them, but <laughs> if you have a look at it, it's quite interesting, because they randomized people's experimental condition was that you had to have a thought experience experiment and form groups and discuss. You landed on an alien planet and you found that, that everybody in that planet was stuck in same-sex housing, they couldn't meet, um, babies were produced artificially, etc. You get the picture. It's kind of moving towards a metaphor of what it's like to be homosexual for heterosexuals. And the other group got just a lecture on homophobia. Okay? It wasn't much of a comparison group, I didn't think, it was this exciting. <laughs> then. But um, attitudes to homosexuality, it's claimed, changed, and they were much more positive a week later. What really astonished me about this study was that the ones in, the, um, in this group didn't click. Most of them, during the thought experiment, didn't click that that might be a metaphor for homosexuality, which I thought was quite <laughs> extraordinary, and probably showed that it worked. And when they were told that this was you know, perfect parallel, and then they answer the question if they were horrified. Oh, is that what it's like to be gay? It's a wee, it's a wee, bit, it's a wee bit too good to be true. But, uh, so people can bring in all sorts of imaginative projects. So, finally, is it all negative? Every time you talk about homophobia, you think, oh, it's terrible to be homosexual because everybody's against you. Well, is there any positive feature here? Are people always talking about homophobia? But is there one area where, when gay people appear, things seem to improve? Well, of course, we can all think of thousands of areas where that might be important. But the one area, anybody got an idea where it can have an effect? House prices. People have actually examined, <laughs> because you examine, uh, you know, if black people move into your neighborhood, what do the house prices do? We knew all about that in the 80s and 90s in America. But what about if gay people do? Well, yes and no. If you live in a liberal area and you get a lot more gay couples, up go your prices. <laughs> if you live in a conservative area, down go. <laughs> so, uh, well, it just shows you should always live in a liberal area. But uh, very interesting. And we know that, that this is quite interesting research, quite big research across the United States, but you only have to look at Soho and other areas of London to see that when gay people enter, the standards rise. So there are, there are all sorts of positive things here that ought to be put forward. Finally, I'm going to stop now, so we've got a good 20 minutes for discussion. I'm going to show you one last video, because I think it's hilarious. If you can hear it, um, I said right at the start that I think humour is often the best way. When, the, when everybody was saying it was the end of the world, a gay marriage, and that well, our society was going to go like the Roman Empire and things, um, the best thing there was humour, and there were a lot of funny articles in the press uh, against it. I come from New Zealand. Some of you may have seen the video clips that were circulating on YouTube about the introduction of gay marriage. Mm. Maybe proud to be a New Zealander mm. um, because it was so funny. And uh, I think it was the Prime Minister at one point um, joking on about uh, how everybody thought the drought was caused by gay marriage. And, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, but this one, I hope you can hear it. This is a comedian in a pub talking about homophobia, and his first words that you might be a bit obscured when you hear it. Uh, saying, um, I, I've, I've come up with several levels of homophobia. So let me just, oh, I want, sorry, I wanted to say here, uh, John Gray is a very interesting author, some of you know, may know, that talks about philosophy and human development. He wrote Straw Dogs and, and wrote, there's another book out recently, I can't remember the name of it, it's just come out. He's in Radio 4 recently, and I think this is very important, and it, you can see it in the Eastern Bloc countries of Europe, in Africa, where things, I haven't even had a chance to talk about Africa much, where things are going back. It's a dangerous myth, and certainly Jewish people will know that to assume that uh, the prejudice has gone away. But uh, if we get on to the little clip, um, let's see what the volume's like. 
very I've invented uh, various levels of homophobia. Uh, the top level of homophobia is when you punch someone just because they're they're not homophobic. <laughs> Use my position, Michael. By, by, uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s, people like Desmond Morris in the Naked Ape were, were arguing that there was a kind of evolutionary basis which created this kind of taboo. In other words, in other words, anything that threatened the maximum reproduction uh, was endangered the species, and therefore that led to homophobia. And I suppose you could argue that some of our societies have changed, perhaps because there is less emphasis now on maximum procreation. Do you think there's anything in that theory? I, yeah, I think there's sort of just so stories that we get from evolution. There's no fossil evidence, but we make up these stories that, that it might be true. We've actually researched this because there's some evidence now, quite a lot of evidence, that it might be beneficial in your family, in an evolutionary sense, to have a gay member. Now, I'll talk about that because it doesn't touch on exactly the issue that uh, someone thinks you're not going to procreate, therefore. In fact, historically, most homosexual and lesbian people do procreate. It's only in, in modern society where the, they have less, fewer children than they might have had. But the issue around the family size is very, very interesting. There's now our research and another group have shown that if you look at the family size in people who are gay, and these are men, in men who, who families who are even counting the fact that they have fewer children in modern society than straight people, there's a larger family size, a significantly large, a very small odds ratio, but huge in terms of the population, which is very interesting, very odd. And it, so there's lots of theories about why um, homosexuality is, if you're thinking in reductionist evolutionary terms, why it's maintained in the face of lower fecundity. That, that might be it. Whether that drives the attitudes or not, I don't know. It doesn't seem to explain the gender difference. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Sue Sanders. I'm co-chair of Schools Out. Um, we gave birth to our LGBT History Month and also a website called The Classroom, which I'm kind of shocked you didn't mention. Um, How to mention it. Um, 38 <laughs> lessons sitting on the website which usualize lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans people. And what we've done is we've produced lesson plans for teachers, maths teachers, chemistry teachers, biology teachers, history teachers, anybody, and they embed the existence of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans people within them, and they connect it to the curriculum. So we're saying, please let's get rid of the gay lesson. Please not have panels talking about, you know, how wonderful we are. Let's just usualize this. And we've coined this word usualize because normalize is a crap word, and we can't use it, can we? Because the implication is, if we use normalise, that there are people who are abnormal. Well, I've, all right, I've been abnormal most of my life, but I think, you know, usual is more effective. So we usualise and actualise. So 
Those lessons have been grabbed by teachers. And they're on the TES websites, they're used across the world. 